tonight, um, I want to say April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. April is also Poetry Month. And so I am in my bag. I am a spoken word artist. I am a social worker, a licensed clinical social worker. And I've been doing social work for the last 27 years. Uh, I was born and raised here in the city of Detroit. I went to Wayne State University and got my BSW and my MSW degrees in the 90s. I actually uh, worked for the Detroit Police Department in their Rape Counseling Center Victim Assistance Program, it's called now, as a clinical social worker work, working with um, experiences of intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, sexual assault, domestic violence. And um, I've been doing sexual assault work uh, my entire professional life, uh, in addition to teaching and uh, working for the police department and starting my own nonprofit. Uh, so I want to say I'm also a active paid member of NASW and I have been an NASW uh, member for the last, I think since 1997, I joined as an undergrad and then um, I continue to uh, pay into my membership because I think it's important to do that. Um, I also think that NASW is a great resource and has served as a great resource uh, for me as a professional social worker. So it is really my joy to meet with Region 11. Uh, I wish this was in person. Um, but until we manage this pandemic, it, it is what it is. Um, so um, one of the things that I also like to share with um, folks is that um, people tend to say, okay, she's the executive director and the founder of the Sasha Center, but I think it's extremely important to also identify myself as a participant of the Sasha Center as well. And what that means is that I also identify openly and publicly as an experiencer of sexual trauma myself. Um, so I don't necessarily have to go into detail about that. I may, it may come out as we're talking, um, but I just wanna make sure that everybody's comfortable, everybody's in the space, everybody's good. If you have your tea, your water, uh, please feel free to uh, leave your cameras on or take them off or make sure you step away if you need to, uh, because I am going to be talking about sexual assault and black women. Uh, I will be very mindful and presenting this in a very trauma-informed way. So I will spare you all any kind of traumatic kinds of details as much as I can. And I also ask that in the training space, if you need follow-up care, please let me, let us know, let, let Danielle, let Kendra know, and we'll make sure that you have that. But this is definitely not the place for a disclosure. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we take care of each other um, and that we take care of ourselves. So with that in mind, I am going to go ahead and forward my slide. So um, tonight I'm going to be specifically unpacking our model, the Sasha Center model, model which is called the Black Women's Triangulation of Rape. Uh, one of the things I'd like to share with all of you about the making of the triangulation model is that it just literally came almost, it seems like it just came out of the air, just like the Sasha Center. Um, it really was um, an attempt to try to create a visual for people to see and understand the barriers that exist for African-American women, uh, particularly in Southeastern Michigan, because those are the out, well, pretty much the starting of the Sasha Center was to address the needs of black women in Southeastern Michigan. And it's not intended to be a program working with anybody else other than black women who were occupying space in Southeastern Michigan, whose families migrated from the South who were enslaved. Uh, so we're very clear about the population that we work with. So with that in mind, uh, I just want you to understand and know that the phone number to the Sasha Center is right on this slide at the bottom. And if somebody wants to put it in the chat, they can, uh, but our phone number for contact and a phone number that you can give to experiences of sexual trauma who are looking to lower their isolation by joining our support groups can call that number 888 a six five seven zero five five, and this is not a crisis line. Uh, this is the phone number that folks call to sign up for our uh, support groups, which are all virtual right now. In the summer, we tend to open up, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move right along. I noticed that there's some activity in the chat. Let me make sure I take a look at that. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for putting that in there. Good evening to everybody. All right, just wanted to make sure. Is Kendra back yet, by the way? Is Kendra back yet? All right. So I'm, I'm back. Gonna... I'm typing oh. into the chat. I'm back. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Hi, Kendra. Welcome back. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I wanted to say too, Kendra and I ended up just happenstance having a conversation when she called the Sasha Center because she had some specific questions she wanted to ask about our work and she wanted to connect me uh, to someone that's doing um, um, some kind of work around intimate partner violence in a film. Uh, and so we got to talking and next thing you know, she was like, nope, we, you've got to come and do this. So thank you for the invitation, Kendra. I'm so glad to be here tonight. And it's my hope that we can really get into this. Now, by the way, I also need to give you one other caveat, and that is we're all experts in the room. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do was uplift the poll question. Um, Kendra or Danielle, can you all put that in there now? Because I kind of want to get a sense of who's in the room or where you think you are. And it's a very simple question. Um, the question is, do you feel prepared to work with the Black women who disclose sexual assault? And that's a yes or a no. Do you feel prepared to work with Black women who disclose sexual assault? And so the poll has is here. And we'll give folks a few minutes to respond. Are the responses coming in? Yep, we are at 78% have responded so far. So we'll just give folks another moment or two. And then sure. I can close that. Sure. Okay. Go ahead and submit your answer. Last call. So with 84% response. Oh, good. Yeah. 52% uh -huh. said yes and 48% said no. Okay, great. So that's kind of half and half in the room. And um, thank you all for your participation and thank you for being honest about that. Uh, those of you who don't feel prepared, please do not feel bad. It's my hope that I give you something tonight that you can hang your hat on or that you can add to your toolkit. Uh, those of you who feel very prepared, it's my hope that sometimes if a question comes up or if a point comes up that you wanna make, that you feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and please, don't feel like you cannot interrupt me. I believe in call and response. We can have question and answer at any given time. Um, and I'm also um, helping, and Danielle's helping me keep uh, mindful of our time. So, uh, but please know that you can interrupt at any time and ask any question that you'd like to know. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep this moving here. Let's see. And all right, so, um, a lot of times, oh, one of the things that I left out is I'm also the lead consultant on relationship safety and management for the National Basketball Association. And it is my job to see that players transition into participate and get out the game whole without making mistakes in the area of gender based violence, intimate partner violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, or anything that's off the court related to their relationships they have with significant others and then specifically and more specifically with their romantic partners. Um, and I always pull this up because a lot of times talking about relationships, talking about sexual assault, all those things can be uh, pretty challenging for all of us based on what we know, or what we think we know, or what we've learned or what we've seen or what we've witnessed uh, growing up, uh, attitudes and beliefs that have come across and been handed down to us through the generations and in our families. And as you're in this space, I am recognizing that it is not easy to have this conversation. Um, but I am asking that we all agree to listen with our hearts with the goal to understand. Let's have mutual respect for each other. Let's take risks. Please feel free to share of yourself. Uh, do not feel compelled to talk about the clients that you work with, but speak on your own behalf as we're having this conversation. Ask questions, get clarification if you need it. I want you all to be as fully present as possible on our time together. And please, again, don't forget to take care of yourselves. And then on the other side of this um, slide, I have uh, the zones. The zones here help us identify where we might find ourselves as we are processing this information together. And and where I want us to be is in the stretch zone, which of course is indicated by the color green. And the stretch zone is where there's an opportunity to teach and learn, share and understand, change and uh, uplift the things that we wanna talk about in a way that's going to help us solve problems and not get stuck in them. Uh, and then also the comfort zone is not where we wanna be. The comfort zone is zoning out, basically not, you know, I'm just gonna stay out of this. I'm not gonna ask anything. I don't know anything. Please don't do that. And then the panic zone, we 
definitely don't want you there. Um, indicated by the red color in the panic zone is where excitement wanes and uh, it's where we, our hearts start palpitating. We start thinking about how we're gonna respond instead of listening for the opportunities to learn and change. Uh, we might wanna start Googling some stuff. Oh, I don't believe that. I wanna push back. That's not what this is. We wanna stay in the stretch zone. Let's all stay in the stretch zone together. So um, with that in mind, I'm gonna keep it moving. So our focus today, um, I hope you learned something from this presentation. That is a question for you all to get active in the chat right now. If there is anything that you hope to learn from this presentation, it's an opportunity now to put that in the chat. Um, but let me identify what our goals are for the rest of the evening. I wanna teach you and help you understand and learn about the Sasha Center. I wanna talk about our model, the Black Women's Triangulation and Rape. Um, I'm also going to do some um, uh, conversation around just setting the stage for what we need to be talking about by unpacking some sexual assault myths and facts, which we may already know, and that might be pretty basic, uh, but I definitely want to get to that so that we can all be on the same page at the same time, and then also talk about specific supports and resources that you all can go to and use specifically for our model and specifically for the work that we do at the Sasha Center. So the first thing I'd like to start out with is this quote from Angela Davis. This quote actually came from a text that she wrote a while ago. I think it was published in 1989. And what she said is that black women were and continue to be sorely in need of an anti-rape movement. She said this in the 80s. And I wanna stop right here and just check in with everybody and get a response from a couple of you. When you see that from Angela Davis, black feminist scholar say black women were and continue to be sorely in need of an anti-rape movement. Uh, what do you think she meant by that? And so as a clinical therapist, I am absolutely used to silence. Uh, and I think silence means that there's some thinking happening uh, and that is totally fine for you all to do that as well. Uh, but I wanna make sure I give someone an opportunity to respond to this quote. Anyone? I'm willing to say something. Um, I think Angela Davis may have been saying that for African-American women, historically, we've always been seen as being invisible mm -hmm. and not being taken serious. And so even if someone would have claimed to be raped, they may not, um, even if it was reported, it may not have been taken as something that was credible. Sure, sure. So it's that extent to which uh, black women are believed is the extent to which, I, you know, there's so many things that we can unpack about this. And thank you for uh, your leadership. And thank you for adding um, and lifting your voice in the room around this statement, because it's a very powerful one. Um, the other thing is that African American women, uh, our history here in this country, uh, we didn't even have the right or dominion over our bodies, and there was no option for no. And so, um, and then also we have to remember that black women's bodies were made into business and it was a commodity. We were having children so that folks could have more slaves, particularly when it became illegal to import slaves. Uh, and so we have never been able to particularly uh, have dominion over our bodies and no was never an option. And then uh, through our research, as we developed the black uh, women's triangulation model, what we also learned is that um, after slavery and during reconstruction, there is no record of punishment of any man, black or white, for the rape of a black woman in this country. Think about that. And it serves even now, uh, what she said, as well as our collective experiences uh, as black women in this country, uh, and then the whole notion about black women having to be strong and resilient. Um, it's almost like we are unrapeable. Uh, and then there are also a circ certain circumstances where sexual assault uh, can't happen to black women. 
um, if they are in the sex industry. Uh, sexual assault can't happen to black women if they dress a certain way. And I mean, I think this also can, we, you know, I don't mean to paint a broad brush here, uh, but I want you all to start thinking about these things. Uh, black girls and black women can't be raped because we're adultified very early on. Georgetown uh, University did a lot of research on the adultification of black women and girls. And if you look at that, you will see that black girls are treated as adults much sooner than anybody else. Um, black women can even in community develop or start to have, uh, start to grow breasts or anything like that without being caught fast in community. Uh, and all of that doesn't serve itself either. So uh, anybody else wanna say anything else? I see something in the chat, let me take a look. Historically, black women have had to deal with trauma in silence. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, something that should not be accepted or tolerated. Um, I get that, Mary. Thank you for uplifting that. Anybody else want to say anything else before I move on to the next slide? Black women were and continue to be sorely in need of an anti-rape movement. Let's think about what happened in Detroit uh, a few years back where it was discovered 11,000 untested, unprocessed rape kits in the city of Detroit. 81% of those kids were uh, DNA of black women. And so that sends a large message about what we're doing. And just to disclose a little bit more, I was actually working at the Detroit Police Department at that time and did not know that they were stockpiling the kids. I found out when the public found out. And when the public found out, I had already stopped working for, um, for that organization. So they had a lot of work to do and they still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but thank God for our prosecutor, Kim Worthy, because she created a process to get all those kids processed. And so now it's, it's moving in a much better direction. Um, and they're actually testing and, and uh, packing all of those rape kits now. Um, but the message and the historic uh, fact that those kids were in, not just an abandoned building being stockpiled, but I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but that building was in the middle of being torn down. So the intention was to destroy evidence of sexual assaults that had happened to 81% of black women here in the city of Detroit. And, and that's an atrocity. So um, needless to say, that's some of the reason why we developed the Fox Center. So here's some more um, stats that I think might be super helpful in terms of us um, orienting ourselves to talk about the model and why it was created. Uh, this came from the uh, ujimacommunity.org, which is a, a Black women and um, rape. Uh, they have Black women rape statistics, but they also are an intimate partner violence um, national organization that collects this kind of data. Uh, and here it says 35% of Black women experience some form of sexual contact in their lifetime. 40 to 60% of black women report being subjected to coercive, sex, coercive sexual contact. 38% of black women experience sexual violence other than rape uh, during their lifetime. 17% of black women experience sexual violence other than rape, uh, especially by an intimate partner during their lifetime. African-American girls uh, between the ages of uh, 12 years and older experienced high rates of rape and sexual assault than white, Asian, and Latina girls uh, and women between the years of 2005 and 2010. Um, and these are stats just telling you that Angela, when she said that in 1989, that she had a uh, representation of why. 11% of black girls in a national high school sample reported having been sexual assault, sexually assaulted and 40% of confirmed sex trafficking survivors in the US are black, 40% y'all are black. And what's really interesting is to pay attention to the rhetoric of commercials and advertisements around human trafficking in and of themselves. Rarely do you see black women and it's 40% of them, almost half are black women. All right, so I also wanted to transition and talk about the extent to which black men are impacted by uh, sexual assault. Um, men experience it as well. Um, many are survivors, but few get the support they need to heal from their experiences. Uh, and this is a quote from Tony Porter, who is an executive uh, director of A Call to Men, which is a national organization that engages men and boys around issues, making sure they talk about healthy masculinity and healthy manhood and how to uh, stand in the gap for women and girls who are being um, uh, 
sexually assaulted or harmed in a way just based on their gender. They also unpack issues of race as well. And one of the reasons why I'm bringing up this experience of men, because I think it's important to also talk about before we go into the Black Women's Triangulation Model, uh, the work that Sasha Center is intentionally doing with men. Uh, it wouldn't be a surprise, I guess, to some of you to know if I'm working for the National Basketball Association, I also do this work for the NFL, NHL, MLB, NCAA, I'm in a lot of spaces with a lot of different men. And some men have definitely shared. Uh, I've had football players just say stuff like, Ms. Kalima, I was this size when I was 11 years old. What do you think happened to me? And so I really think it's important that you all understand our engagement with, with men and Black men particularly. Um, some of the things that come up at the Sasha Center when we're working with Black men is that we first have to unpack the traumatic experience of lynching in this country uh, to even begin to massage a decent conversation uh, with black men about rape and accusations of rape uh, because there are so many black men who are in Tennessee at that um, at the uh, at the memorial site of, of lynchings who were lynched just for the carnal knowledge or looking at um, white women and in particular um, I always think about Emmett Till and what happened to him and the violence that uh, occurred in that. Uh, and that also impacts us generationally and we remember those stories. And so it's really an interesting um, uh, job to engage black men around these conversations. We definitely always bring this thing up to, to open it up so we can learn more, hear more and, and, and actually develop more programming. Um, the other thing is that the men that we work with at the Sasha Center tend not to disclose that they've been sexually assaulted. What they tend to do though is they come to group for support because they love a woman who has been sexually assaulted. So it could be their mothers, their wives, their girlfriends, the mother of their children, their own daughters. Uh, there's some reason why they wanna interface with us and that's okay. And that is our prevention and education arm. We spend a lot of time in men's space uh, talking about these issues, um, particularly around prevention and education. So every year we have about 16 sessions a year where black men can come and it's free of service and free of charge uh, and participate in um, to one to two hour long conversations around uh, issues related to sexual assault. So I want to bring that up. And then I also wanna say that it's important and I always wanna bring this up is that most men don't agree with this stuff. Uh, most men are not born violent. Uh, men have the ability to stop violence. Uh, men have to develop a strong and interactive relationship with other men to, to stop violence. Uh, and it's a challenge, but at the Sasha Center, we are always trying to make sure that we make room and space for that. Anybody want to respond to that? Any questions? Anything in the chat? Just want to check in. All right. Did someone unmute? Okay. So now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's let's get to this. Sexual assault defined, y'all need to know what this is. If you don't, it's a lack of consent. Uh, sexual assault happens when someone touches another person in a sexual manner without their consent. And I'm just bringing this up because uh, I think we just need to be aware of what we're talking about. Because in the African-American community, uh, we don't have a working definition. We tend not to have a working definition of what rape is. And how that manifests at the Sasha Center is we provide support group services for self-identified experiences of rape. And we also allow their supporters to come with them. So survivors can come to group with their, with their therapists. Survivors can come to group with their family members who are safe, that they love, that they want with them, their friends, their partners, they can come. Um, but we definitely have groups that are unfortunately in the binary. It's either a group for men or a group for women. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic happening right now. We have a group right now and it's called our AYA group circle, our AYA, I always say AYA, but it's AYA, but it's spelled A-Y-A, our AYA group circle, where everyone in those sessions identify as either non-gender conforming or along the spectrum of LGBTQI. Uh, but if we call it that, they're not gonna come, but that's where they go. So uh, we are servicing this population population, although we don't um, apply labels. Uh, but with this sexual assault piece here, um, I think it's important that we talk about it because what happens is a lot of times supporters will call us and say, my sister really wants to come. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll let her come. But then once everybody's in the room and we start defining sexual assault, they'll say, oh, well, if that's how you're defining sexual assault, then I should be here anyway, because I've experienced that. 
Um, and so I always like to bring up the definition uh, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, and then here, of course, no me, no stated at any time, but a whole lot of other things look like no. And in black communities where black girls are raised not to say no to anything, but to say yes to everything, uh, because that we're supposed to be um, the matriarchs of our families and things like that, it becomes a real serious challenge. Um, but I just wanted to put this out here. So here are some basic myths and facts. Women are most likely to be raped outside after dark. I know this is old school, but people really still believe this stuff. We have, I think during the pandemic, all of these folks on the internet whose names I can't name, won't bring them up if I did, uh, started having these platforms where they're talking about these things. And I heard um, some man say, uh, if you don't want to have sex with a man, don't go on a date with him after six o'clock. And I'm like, what? Yes, and it's all kinds of misinformation out here in the world. So um, women are most likely to be raped outside after dark and by strangers. So women should not go out alone at night. Uh, we know that that's, that not, that's not true. Uh, the fact is below around 10% of rapes are committed by strangers. Around 90% of rapes are committed by people that people know. Uh, the next myth, only young, attractive women and girls who are flirtatious and wear tight clothes are raped. Uh, and then think about how this myth lays, this myth creates a real dangerous situation for black women. Um, because what is attractive in this country? Uh, what is seen as the standard of beauty in this country? And so if that person is not standing in that space, it also makes it difficult for people to believe that a sexual assault has even occurred. But the fact of the matter is, and we all know this, is that people of all ages, appearances, classes, cultures, abilities, sexualities, races, and all are and can be victims of sexual assault. And then the last one here is when it comes to sex, women and girls sometimes play hard to get and say no when they really mean yes. Uh, we know that that is not true. Everyone has a legal right to say no to sex. So I'm putting that out there for a reason. And I'm putting that out there because, uh, again, um, the stereotypes that exist for Black women and girls around and, and the fact that we're over-sexualized all pose problems uh, for these understandings of these myths and facts. So... All right, so I'm going to transition really quickly and tell you a little bit about the Sasha Center. The Sasha Center is 12 years old, uh, so she's a preteen. That's the way I like to talk about uh, the organization. And as you all know, as a preteen, there's a lot of development and growth still left to happen. Um, but we were founded in 2012, I'm in 2020, 2010, I'm sorry. And um, Sasha is an acronym and it stands for Sexual Assault Services for Holistic Healing and Awareness. And I would be remiss if I did not thank the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence because they provided us with technical assistance uh, to help us develop our brand and our programming. Um, and for our 10th anniversary, we added the African-centered onk uh, into the scarf because it used to just be the teal scarf. And those of you who know or may not know, teal is actually the color for sexual assault Awareness Month. And so we tried to combine those two things in our, our logo. And I'm talking about the logo specifically because uh, we believe that uh, it's a representation of, of our work. Um, so our mission, um, and I definitely want you all to see this, our mission is, hold on one second. Um, our mission at the Sasha Center is to increase awareness, provide resources, and educate the public about sexual assault, provide culturally specific peer educational support groups to self-identify survivors of rape, and to increase justice and visibility for survivors in southeastern Michigan. Um, in our strategic plan, and we're working on that right now with our board of directors, we are really thinking about changing some of the wording in this mission statement. Um, instead of saying identify survivors, we're going to change it to identified experiencers of sexual assault. Assault, um, because what we've learned in working with Black women and girls, uh, 16 years of age or older is who we uh, work with with our support groups, is um, that sometimes uh, Black women present and they say, I'm not a survivor, I'm not a victim, I'm not a thriver, I'm not any of those things. I don't know what I am today. I might be that tomorrow, I might have been that yesterday, but right now that's not it. And so when we say experiencer, what that does for us, and no one else has picked it up yet, no one else is saying it, it's just us at the Sasha Center and that's okay, because it's just us at the Sasha Center doing a lot of this um, impactful work with black women intentionally. Um, but when we say experiencer, that gives that person who has experienced that sexual trauma, the freedom and the opportunity to space in the room to be something different 
from moment to moment, day to day, hour to hour, week to week, month to month. Um, and we say survivors particularly because that's pretty much what the funding does. That's pretty much what community does. That's pretty much how uh, folks talk about it. And I understand that it's, it's tied to the empowerment model and that makes sense. Uh, but we also think that the next level to empowerment is really allowing people to name themselves. Um, I see something in the chat, yep. Yep, Rebecca, they do. Um, and it's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying that we should throw it away. I'm just saying at the Sasha Center that we wanna be a little bit more intentional and use the word. And, and, and it's a made up word. When you look in the Oxford Dictionary, they don't have experiencers. Uh, but then again, in a lot of the research and data that we've used to even formulate the Black Women's Triangulation Model, you find that there are lots of words that Black women scholars, feminist scholars have come up with, like Moya Bailey, when she talks about misogynoir, or um, Kimberly Crenshaw when she's talking about intersectionality or uh, Dr. McKittrick when she's talking about respatializing, which are all the things that we engage in at the Sasha Center. We'll talk a little bit more about that. All right, so I'm just gonna move ahead. So our guiding principles, um, these are the ones I wanted to uplift the most in this room and sharing with you all in terms of the work and way we do it at the Sasha Center. But I need to also say immediately that we are trauma informed. Um, the majority of our facilitators have uh, advanced degrees, um, but then we also have facilitators who are survivors who have participated in group and they've graduated and, and actually came into our fold as uh, presenters and as facilitators as well. All of our staff mostly are contracted. We have three part-time staff and I'm one of the three part-time staff. Um, but I wanna say our guiding principles of course are trauma-informed, but we also believe that dignity and respect is extremely important. Um, we also believe and develop our programs understanding that culture cures and that history heals. We believe in group healing uh, exclusively. We don't have individual therapy or anything like that. And of course we are African-centered and African-centered, I can really get more into that. But um, just to give you an example right now, we're actually working on an eight week group um, that people can join. And each week we're going to unpack an African proverb. Uh, and we also, um, when we say we're African-centered, we're always asking um, what do African black folks do around the diaspora and how can that assist us here with black women and girls. And since the pandemic, we have black women who join us from all over the world, all over the country, at least for sure. We had somebody as far as Hawaii um, participate in our sessions and um, we're still very intentional and deliberate around working with black women and girls who uh, were born in the United States whose families were enslaved. Uh, and one of the reasons why we stick with that is because uh, black women are always doing the work without having time and space to be the work. And so that we are very intentional in allowing black women to be the work, uh, to do the work, but to also benefit from the work and to also grow and heal in the work at the same time, if that makes sense. So any questions about this? Just one check in. Comments? And so I was, if I was to say more about culture and history, uh, we believe that at the Sasha Center, when you learn more about your culture, when you engage in your culture, when your culture is uplifted, however you are in culture and in community, that it provides an opportunity for more healing and integration. And we also uh, look at history and not history in terms of just looking at how bad our history was in terms of our, uh, in terms of our um, being brought here as slaves, but then also looking at the resilience and the strength of our people collectively. Uh, also looking at the ways in which we have turned something into nothing. Nothing. Also looking at the ways in which we use principles from, uh, for instance, um, Kwanzaa uh, and talking about um, the ways that we uh, actually engage in community. And so uh, part of our culture cures history heals is that we have taken survivors of sexual assault experiencers uh, on uh, culture cures history heals um, intensive um, group uh, sessions, uh, psychoeducational, I have to say that. Um, to uh, New Orleans, uh, we have had uh, sessions at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, right before the pandemic, we were planning sessions at the African American Museum, also at the Motown Museum, 
And it is my goal eventually to take a group of experiences of sexual trauma from Southeastern Michigan to Ghana, West Africa. Um, I had an opportunity to take students at Mary Grove to Ghana, West Africa a couple of times. And so I've been around the corner for that a few times. So I wanna bring that programming to uh, the work that we do at the Sasha Center. All right, so I'm being mindful of our time. Here are some of our culturally uh, sensitive techniques that we involve ourselves in at the Sasha Center. Storytelling, humor, irony, and satire is sometimes used when um, survivors are talking about trauma and we give them that opportunity to have that space. Because in mainstream programs, when humor, irony, and satire come up about sexual assault, domestic violence, or intimate partner violence, sometimes survivors get punished for that, get asked to step out of group, or get asked to, um, you know, get psyche vows and all kinds of stuff. But actually, in community, sometimes to deal with the insurmountable amount of pain that we've dealt with, sometimes humor, irony, and satire is just what they need. Um, prayer, meditation, and quiet time, music, dance, and art writing and journaling, food, gardening and sustainability, hula hooping, biking, running, ancestor reverence. We teach um, our survivors how to engage with their ancestors. Uh, crystals, water, African-centered exercise like Afro-Cuban dance, um, talking here, healing and hope, accountability. And we even allow survivors to talk and, and, and tell us how urban legends in their communities and how family stories in their communities have impacted the way that they see themselves as they integrate the traumatic experience. So the Black Women's Triangulation of Rape model, this model was designed to service um, um, providers, funders, and the community at large, a model to understand and see the barriers that exist for Black women who need sexual assault services. Black women who disclose need to receive culturally specific services regarding rape and sexual assault for a full and integrated experience for healing. Um, and we had a model um, committee of people help us with this uh, who came from all walks of life, as you all know, and I'm going to just say it just because it needs to be said, Black women are not monolithic. Uh, so at the table from our model committee, we had um, Black women who were sex workers, Black women who identify as lesbian, Black women who are non-gender conforming, um, Black women who are trans women. We've had Black women all feed into this. Uh, we've had Black women scholars, doctors, lawyers, uh, um, community women, uh, some of my hair clients, those of you who don't know, I actually cultivate um, locks uh, is what we call them. Um, but I make natural hair uh, do things. And so I have a little small studio in Detroit and we even ask participants or people who come to get their hair done to feed and tell us about this model and help us grow it. And it took two years. So um, we met and we talked and we had um, community meetings about um, this model. And I definitely wanna say that it was extremely important to come up with this model so people could see how sometimes funding doesn't fit, um, how sometimes programming and the ways in which reporting back what the work that we're doing doesn't fit, um, about how we need to raise money for food because black folks don't get together without eating. Uh, and, and I don't mean to sound like I'm stereotyping us, but we gather and we eat and we create these safe spaces around food sometimes. And it's important that we have access to it, um, healthy food specifically. So um, all of those things fed into this model as we developed it. One of the things I wanted to say is if you can see your screen, please uh, open your phone and open your camera and scan that QR code. This QR code will take you directly to our website uh, and this is uh, something that we're super proud of at the Sasha Center, which also explains the kit, I mean, explains the model in great detail. Um, for Sexual Assault Awareness Month this, this year, 2022, we uh, are allowing people to have access to our toolkit. Um, we have a free version of the toolkit that is available right now on the website. Um, and it's a PDF and that doesn't cost you anything. You can download it and read about our work and how we do it. Um, then there's an actual physical toolkit book that will cost you $75. And with that, we won't have that one ready till October, but you know, as shout out to Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, but October, you'll be able to pay $25 and then also get a Prezi presentation where we're talking about the model and everything that we do. Uh, and then if you want, a more um, intense training uh, in virtual, you know, in virtual in-person 
uh, training, um, we can definitely have that. You can inquire by sending an email to us. And um, thank God for Danielle and Kendra because they're gonna try to make sure that we can offer CEUs for this. Uh, the Sasha Center has offered social work CEUs in the past, uh, but since the pandemic, we have not had an opportunity to do that, but we will be doing that again. And so you will have an opportunity for those trainings that are virtual or in person to also earn CEUs. But more specifically, um, we are very excited about our toolkit and we're very excited about being able to tell people how we do the work. Um, I, would, I would definitely advise everybody to tread lightly uh, just because you have the book and the text does not mean that you can carry these things out uh, because there are all kinds of nuances that exist. Um, but it is a beginning to helping people who want to call Sasha Center and expect for me to give them the entire TED Talk just because they're calling. Um, it's best if they start to do their own work and do some of their own reading. So here is a quick version, quick view of the Black Women's Triangulation of Rape model. It is way more intense than this, uh, but I definitely wanted to show you all the quick view. And really, uh, when we developed this, uh, we were very intentional about the colors we used, about the shapes that we used, about the wording that we used, and about the, uh, the, the way that we did it. It was almost like the person and environment when you look at it. Um, and it, it looks the same way here as I can see it. But policies and funding is what fueled us in making this uh, model for people to understand the, the, the kinds of ways in which Black folks experience stuff. Um, and then denial, so, so it really just breaks it down, but I wanna go through it one by one. So you see racism and you see societal barriers on the outside of the triangle, meaning that that is always happening. That is always fueling the things that happen to black women and girls as they try to get the help they need on a journey after being sexually assaulted. Uh, and at the very top of this triangle, you see the fact that black women have been dehumanized, they're over-sexualized, they're stereotyped, they're objectified, they're, they are objectified in this country and folks want to be us, but they really don't want to be us. So we talk about a cultural appropriation and what, how that impacts the way things show up and then um, denying resources with systemic um, barriers. And then oppression and slavery is, all, is the foundation of, of what brought all this other stuff um, up, the, up the actual uh, triangle. And one of the things I want to say particularly is um, Black women, really have to deal with all of this. Like say for instance, if they decide they wanna press charges or say for instance, if they decide they want an investigation, um, you know, those kind of things come up. We had a survivor, um, I, not in Michigan, but she came to group and she shared with us. She doesn't live in Michigan, but she's been uh, around. Um, had an officer asked her, cause we gotta talk about language. And the, the investigator asked her, did you know this man? And her answer was, I entertained him. And then the next question was, what strip club do you work at? And that's not what she meant at all. When she said, I entertained him, she said that, that really in community, if you live in a black community, um, somebody in the room helped me out. If she says I entertained him, what does she mean? Please don't leave me hanging, y'all. When the officer asked her if she knew the perpetrator, and she said, I entertained him, what does she mean? It could mean a range of things. It could mean that he could have been a guest in her home. He could yep. have, she could have had a, con a casual conversation with him. She could have yep. met him in passing. She could know him through knowing other people who know him. So Absolutely. It was, it was a number of ways that he could have been entertained. It means that he is somewhere in her consciousness and somewhere um, that he that that she knows of him. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, any, anything other than that. Absolutely. And thank you for raising that in the room, because I don't want to be the only one in here sounding like I'm making this stuff up. You and I don't even know each other, but we knew that. And that's culture. And that's how we understand and know that things, certain things happen. We had someone in group once say, I blame myself for my rape. That's not unusual. You hear survivors say that no matter what background they have. But her story behind why she blamed herself was that she went down one alley and not another alley, but she avoided that alley because everybody know the pig lady lived down there. The pig lady is an urban legend. 
scholars have written about the pig lady, uh, uh, Candyman in Chicago, you know, all these different places where these urban stories came up. I grew up understanding and knowing who the pig lady was, although I never seen her in person. And they say there's always some truth to it, but I never saw a pig lady in person. But that whole story at my mama's kitchen table was she really was a witch and that she liked eating children and she took vacations in the summer and she really found kids extra delicious between eight o'clock and 3 p.m. Where am I supposed to be between eight o'clock and 3 p.m.? And it's not the summer. Come on, y'all. At home. In school. At school, yeah. Yes, thank you. In school. And so it's these kind of nuances that we haven't made space for in mainstream organizations, which is why we are so intentional at the Sasha Center because we want to make room for this stuff. When we started working with survivors, teaching them how to do ancestors tables and how to do uh, reverence and all of that, and get, talk about your crystals that you have channeled that's in your bra and all of that. I remember one time we did, did an opening, a call and response, and one lady said, well, you know, had I known that you all were doing this, I'd brought my Florida water. It was like, we got that too. And so the Sasha Center is an agnostic organization. Let me be really clear. And we really try to make space for people, however they show up in terms of their own beliefs and their ideas about the world and about, about uh, omnipotency, uh, all of that. We make sure that people have space so they can be agnostic, atheist, Muslim, Christian, uh, all of those things and above. And we really try to make sure that we make that kind of space for them. And our um, facilitators are trained and definitely we always are doing uh, technical assistance and training around making sure that we teach our survivors as well as ourselves how to make room for each other. Um, so let me get into this, the process. So um, these are the things that we say that black women have experienced, which makes it difficult for them to get help, makes it dif difficult for people to respond to them and also difficult for people to allow them to have safe space. Um, the process is devaluing, uh, denial of the experience. Our mere experiences are invalidated. <clears throat> Somebody said that earlier, excuse me. We're presumed incompetent. Uh, intra racism in and of itself, uh, internal impression, racial loyalty to a fault. Um, we have been over policed so much that Black women and girls may not call the police when they've been sexually assaulted. That may not be the first uh, response that they want uh, or the response that they look at. Uh, speaking of which, I want to also bring up really quickly uh, a text if you don't have, you should get. Uh, this is a book edited by Aisha Shahida Simmons, uh, and it's called Love with Accountability. And it is asking people of color, particularly how they want and how and what they needed when they were child sexual assault experiencers uh, for community to respond, how they needed the family to respond. And most of those responses in that text, it's called Love with Accountability. Um, don't, inv uh, don't involve the police at all. But uh, the other process is the a process of dehumanizing Black women and girls by silencing them, making them invisible, microaggressions, assaults, homophobia, and heterosexism, denial of humanity to the LGBTQI community. Uh, those things also serve as barriers. And then stereotyping. Um, uh, saying that Black women are hypersexual, mammies, the tragic mulatto, sapphire, Jezebel, look these things up. These are all tropes. Uh, and these tropes stick with us and make it hard for people to service us in a way with dignity and respect. We want sex more than any other races at any cost, or we're always angry, or we're just the opposite. We don't want sex at all. We can't be anything. We, we can't be anything in between and in both. So um, let me take a look at the chat. Um, yep, thank you so much for uh, putting that in, Danielle. Uh, that is a resource to the text that I was just referring to. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say, and I'm also being very mindful because I want to make sure y'all have time for questions, over-sexualizing, uh, misogyny, as I said earlier, misogynoir, objectification, Black women are only depicted as maids, uh, biased advertising, um, look up Sarah Bartman if you don't know who she is, which is, um, her other name is the Venus Hottentot, and the historical um, importance of that. Um, we're either asexual, unattractive, we should just be happy to be alive, so I know ain't nobody raping you because you don't fit the beauty standard. Uh, cultural appropriation, sexualizing our culture, like the way we dance, making our children provocative, uh, music media industry, we want to talk about, we always 
well, what also informed us is post-traumatic slave syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGru. Uh, her work is amazing and she is a social worker. She's an MSW uh, and then she got her doctorate. And basically what she did was she coined the phrase post-traumatic slave syndrome and talk about how that impacts us even today, which also keeps us from getting the services and um, the responses that we need when we're assaulted. Um, the environment, um, what happens in the environment is sometimes the policy driven rules keep us from having resources, uh, gatekeeping, uh, creating loopholes, uh, the unemployment system doesn't respond to us, government assistance programs are punished, uh, are punitive, uh, systemic barriers like those autistic rape kits I talked about, inadequate uh, systems, uh, police brutality against black men, uh, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, all of those things uh, are problematic. Now, we have a film that I wanna show, and I think it's important that you see it uh, because that film, what it does is it will put all of what I just said to you in context. It's an actual uh, news piece that's about five minutes long uh, by the root. But what I'd like um, for Danielle to do is if you promise me, uh, we'll put that uh, link in the chat. And if you go and watch it afterwards, all of this hopefully will come together for you. The only thing that I ask is that you only watch it to five minutes and 50 seconds exactly right after Tarana Burke speaks. Um, and Tarana Burke is the African-American woman who founded the Me Too movement. Um, right at right at 550, um, because at that point it's just talking about R. Kelly and um, some other Bill Cosby and so and, and, and it's a little dated. But right before that, um, it really breaks down exactly what this model is, is, is trying to do and explain. So thank you so much. I see that in the chat. Um, I also wanted to put in here COVID-19 and the impact on black survivors. One of the things I want you all to recognize is that COVID-19 uh, impacts black women's sexual assault experiences very differently um, than it did. We learned this uh, during the pandemic based on the calls that we got from survivors, um, the, a loss of routine, loss of income. Uh, one of the main ones I like to bring up in here is the cultural expectations of gathering and grieving. Uh, for was dying left and right and black women were expected to be there with the chicken and everything else and don't care if you catch it don't care if you have a vaccine or not you got to be there uh those were very impactful to our survivors another thing that impacted us is uh the stay-at-home orders uh folks were staying at home isolated and next thing you know they started getting triggered uh, and so that's when we had to pivot and actually start doing our groups virtually. And it's actually working really well. And unless it's a culture cures history heals uh, active activity where we have to gather, uh, the virtual has pretty much been working out for us. Trans women, uh, frontline workers, a lot of black women were, um, and they found themselves uh, in, in situations, power and control dynamics, lack of transportation, lack of technology. Uh, we're still trying to address that for folks who wanna join our groups. Uh, just don't even have the technology to do so. So uh, this is just an active picture I wanted to show to remind everybody that Take Back the Night is this Friday. It's virtual uh, with Wayne State University. And um, a lot of these pictures came from a lot of uh, work that Black women have been doing to acknowledge and recognize that our bodies are valuable, sacred, and important, uh, and that we should be celebrated and honored in all of the ways that we show up. Um, our virtual uh, Take Back the Night is in partnership with the Council um, with the uh, Council on the Status of Women with Wayne State University, where I serve as a commissioner. Um, also, uh, Wayne, State, Wayne State University in general, and then uh, we partner with different organizations who are going to be a part. We want to have a live DJ giveaways. Uh, we also partner with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, which I am a member, a proud member. And um, we are going to celebrate survivors. Our Take Back the Night uh, really got its teeth at Mary Grove College, where we actually were able to have that Take Back the Night there uh, for probably seven years of the 12 that we've been doing it. And uh, just a shout out to uh, one of our sisters from Mary Grove started the original um, blueprint for that flyer and we kept it the same uh, in honor of her. Uh, so if you want more information about that, I can actually uh, send you to our website. 
uh, www.sashacenter.org. And um, you can just click on uh, Take Back the Night Detroit tab and it'll take you right to talking about the importance of Take Back the Night uh, nationally, internationally, and the Take Back the Night Detroit here, uh, which was established by women of color, ran by women of color and decided upon by women of color. Um, and then here are some of our actual flyers. If you go to our website, uh, if you go to registration and that's how you tell survivors to reach out to us because we're eventually going to want to interact with them to give them the opportunity. Um, to, to, to determine if they want to participate in our groups. Uh, I, we cannot turn anybody away because of their race or anything else. And so you'll be surprised who are in group. Um, but I will say this, that we ask people to not take up too much space because we are um, you know, a very small organization and there are multi-million dollar sexual assault programs throughout Michigan and in Detroit that have these services and more group individual therapy, rape kit exams. And we actually have a partnership with the larger agencies in case survivors need more than just what we offer. But we unapologetically provide group space, group healing, and that's what we're going to always do. Um, that's what we, um, that, that was our goal in life. And so, and one of the main reasons why we did that is because for a time there, um, there was a, a, a notion that there were not any support groups for survivors of sexual assault in the city of Detroit. And that's why we developed the Sasha Center so that we could say that it, it, there is actually. And we have people who do not identify as black that do participate in group, but there are some very interesting dynamics that come up and we just make sure that we address them. Um, and so here are some resources for you all. And I will make sure I send this um, PowerPoint out so that Danielle can share it amongst the participants in the room. And I want say thank you and I am so sorry it is absolutely eight o'clock but I am willing to stay on if you all are I do want to be respectful of your time uh, but I definitely want to make sure we make room for questions uh, and I do thank you all for your uh, your time and your um, participation and being in this space and as social workers I cannot say how important and how valuable you are uh, in whatever space that you're working in and here's one thing I know for sure wherever black people are so is sexual trauma so please feel free to give our our information out in any space you might find yourself in because uh, you never know who might benefit from lowering that isolation by being in, in, in community with with each other around these issues thank you so much and i'm going to stop my share i think that was it um and i will turn this back over to our coordinators thank you so much i really appreciated hearing the presentation uh you are so intentional with your words and what resonated most with me is that the um, Sasha Center provides an opportunity for Black women and all women to be able to transition from being the worker to being the work. That is so, because historically we've taken care of our families, other people's families, the church, everyone but ourselves. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And if anyone has any comments or questions, this is the time to go ahead and unmute and feel free to ask. I have a quick uh, comment. I, I just want to first by thanking my soror and my sister social worker. You did an excellent job. My only complaint is that this presentation was not longer. I could have heard you go on for another hour. Um, just a quick comment. When you asked a question about the demons coming out between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m., I misunderstood because in the, my mother's from the South. And in the South, the demon comes out at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of acknowledging that young girls, young Black girls are not safe after 11 p.m. And so you need to be in the house um, if you wanted to you know, sign, kind of secure survival as a young black woman out on the streets by yourself because you could have been anyone's prey. And that was their way of keeping you, letting you know that by 11 p.m., you know, right after the street lights went on, you need to be home. Um, another point I wanted to make, and I saw this in your model a little bit, and I would love if Anna Stubb could have you come back and talk about this at length, is the, um, what I call verbal, and visual assaults mm -hmm. of black women on social media yep. um, and the various platforms and how so many girls are, while they're not physically being assaulted, they are being verbally and visually assaulted. So I'd Absolutely. love at some point to have you come back and hear more on that. And my last point is how can we support you um, financially um, you. in this yeah. way? I know nonprofits all over the place are struggling and if there's any way that we could help you within your fundraising or just in donations. Please share that information. Um, as she sends that out, please send that out to all of us so that we can support the good work that you're doing, my sister. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, my sister. And actually, if you go to the website, you can click the donate button right there and um, uh, it'll take you to our PayPal account. Our PayPal account works and it's 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 a good way to do it. Uh, then we also have a PO box on there if you all wanna do uh, old school and mail the check. We would appreciate any and all fundraising. And um, one of the things I really wanna bring up about that, and thank you for even uh, talking about it, is a lot of times, a lot of people don't understand that Sometimes we use our resources to help participants in group uh, get their hair done, pay their bills, groceries, gas, feminine hygiene products, all of those things. And, and you can't begin to imagine us trying to explain to official funders that us getting our hair done is extremely important and it is a special need. It is not for vanity at all. It is actually because we need it. Uh, and so we have an ongoing relationship with Everett's Braiding and Cornrow Academy. Uh, and um, people who participate in group can actually call there and they have like $150 that they can spend with themselves or their children if they want uh, to get um, basic uh, uh, protective styles. Oh, that's... Oops, Klima. Oh, hi Klima. Hi. Hey, hey. Uh, a few weeks ago, I attended uh, a Zoom understanding the impact of sexual assault in the Lives of African-American Women by Samira Howe. Yes. Um, and and one, one of the big points she made, you know, we talk about trauma-informed, but she said it really needs to also be social justice-informed. Yes. That trauma happens within a political, economic, social, cultural context. Yes. And, She's my um, mentor, by the way. Is she? <laughs> yes, I love Samira, yep. It was excellent because I've attended a lot of workshops on trauma-informed and that's the big catch-all now, trauma-informed, but rarely does it include social justice-informed. That you know? part, absolutely. So I know when I attend some more of these, I'm going to bring up that issue that we need to talk about it within a political context. It doesn't happen in isolation. So absolutely. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And you're absolutely right. And I think that our model really forwards the whole idea around oh, exactly. social justice. Oh, that's yeah. a Sasha Center. Exactly. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That feels perfectly within it. So yes, thank you. Yes. Well, thank, thank you. you. So glad you're here. Anybody else? And I've got stuff in the chat I need to make sure I'm paying attention yeah. to. Yeah, I was going to read the question from the chat from Abigail. Um, she said, you shared a powerful statistic at the beginning of the session that there is a long history with no black or white men charged with the rape of a black woman. Do you recall when the first charge occurred? No, not at all. That's a very good question. I don't know. Um, I think that Ujima, dot, uh, the one ujimacommunity.org, they may know. So that was the resource I would, I would go back to them and look at what they've written because that's where I got that from. So, uh, well, we all talk about it, but no, I don't, I don't know what the first one was. And I really try at the Sasha Center to focus on experiencers and survivors as opposed to tracking what perpetrators are doing. So I don't know, sorry. And then we just want to remind everyone that your feedback is important to us. Please complete the evaluation and download your CE certificate and the um, link is in the chat. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions, comments? You have done a phenomenal job. You have kept us all engaged for over an hour. So <laughs> you've learned. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, this is my heart's uh, desire to talk about and to uplift the experiences of black women and girls who experience sexual trauma. And uh, it's my hope that everybody continues. Um, I would like to leave you all with a, um, with a notion um, uh, that uh, social influencer, author, writer, Darnell Moore, who actually wrote the foreword to this text that I'm talking about, uh, he believes that black radical love is necessary for healing the black community. And I wanna say that that includes all black people, no matter how they show up and all people, no matter what race you are. If you center the most marginalized group of people, you tend to end up serving everybody better. So let's have a little black radical love. Uh, let's continue to center the stories and voices of those who are marginalized. And uh, I want you all to continue to do the work. But please make sure you take care of yourself tonight, too.
Yes, that's important. Thank you, Kendra. You've done a great job too. Oh, thank you. You're so welcome. And are there any more questions before we close out? She's still here. What a wonderful gift. Okay. So maybe we can have you. I just, I just want to make another comment. Kalima, when she taught at, at, at Marigrove College, was a wonderful professor. Okay. So <laughs> I, want to, I want to throw that in there. Yeah, um, well, because of you. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, no, I was no, just no. telling somebody about you the other day about how. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, you are, let me share this. I actually am starting my PhD work in the fall in Wonderful. English in English literature. Wonderful. Yes, and I'm going to be writing about uh, humor, irony, and satire, uh, and rhetoric of Black women uh, in terms of how they talk about trauma. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So I was just telling my rhetoric professor how uh, when you gave me that Detroit uh, in communities, uh, Oh, uh, of course. Change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have this new book rhetoric uh, that was called Digital Detroit, written by a professor from uh, U of D. He's not there anymore. But I was mm -hmm. like, I wish me and James knew him back then when he was writing yeah. this yeah. real piece of work. You know, it, it's real, just real quickly. Yeah. I'm 78 years old and still have my private practice. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm still going into the home doing mental health counseling. And a lady today, uh, I've seen her three times with uh, lung cancer going over chemo. But today she came out with um, being sexually assaulted by her, by her father. And she had all of those things that you said, the guilt that she had. She said, I was well-developed early on, all of that self-blame that she had. So um, uh, she had all of those, those characteristics that, 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 that you mentioned. Well, yeah. I would like to help you if you want to have send her to group, please feel free. Yeah, I was thinking about that, you know. Yeah, because we don't ask uh, people to disclose. Yeah, I mean, uh, the vast, uh, probably about 70% of the people I see have been, because they're older. And at that yeah. time, no one has ever told, you know, yes. and, and, and you simply didn't tell. And for a lot of times, I'm the first person that they've wow. told. She had, wow. She's kept that inside of her for uh, about 70 years. And what a gift. Can, anyway, yeah. yeah. What a yeah. gift. And the way we were in group, um, uh, uh, professors, I really want you to know that we run our groups intergenerationally, which yeah. means that we may have someone in group that's 17 years old, but then we may have mm -hmm. someone in the group that's 78 years old, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they help each other in exactly. ways like being, it's like being at the family reunion. And it's a, yeah. just a wonderful opportunity for mm -hmm. folks to process. So You're doing thank you wonderful for work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Yes, thank you so much. I think everyone has asked the questions. Um, did you see in the chat before we leave? I want you to see all of the uh, yeah, excellent job, you know, thought provoking. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And I was trying to catch up with one. So uh, we could just stay on a little while. I just kind of want to, just me and you, you know, and Danielle. I want to make sure I get uh, all of these things in case I need to do a follow up because I, I missed a couple of them. Um, so yeah, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Kendra. I'm gonna hang out for a minute here because I I do I have some direct messages I need to read. I won't read them out loud, but I, I need to see them. So. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. And then I, you will be um, made given a copy of this uh, presentation as well. The link. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. And then yes, Marsha, I think if that's how you say your name, said don't forget to wear your denim tomorrow. Tomorrow is International Denim Day. Uh, and tomorrow I am actually, uh, we have one of our board members who's doing a fundraiser at the block tomorrow, uh, which is on Woodward Avenue uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. If people want to come out, hang out with us for a little while, wear your denim, and we'll have a great time. So uh, follow us on all the social media handles, Instagram, Twitter. We got two Twitter pages because my interns say I I don't know how to tweet uh and then we have our website and then we also have our facebook page uh and we're really active on the facebook page and the instagram page so if you want to know about whatever we're doing you can even send survivors and experiences there as well because we have lots of content unpacking the model and lots of content talking about the work that we do here in the city of detroit so 